أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه كما يحب ربنا وما يرضى وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد We like to continue with these selections from the book Al-Adab Al-Mufrad by Imam Al-Bukhari رحمه الله تعالى Imam Al-Bukhari said قال حدثنا قتيبة قال حدثنا جرير عن الأعمش عن مجاهد عن أبي معمر عن عبد الله قال لا يصلح الكذب في جد ولا هزل ولا أن يعد أحدكم ولده شيئا ثم لا ينجز له ثم لا ينجز له <clears throat> Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah he said that Qutayba narrated to us who said that Jarir narrated to us from Al-A'mash from Mujahid from Abu Ma'mar from Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala anhu who said lies are of no use in either seriousness or jest. Also, it is not right for someone to promise something to his or her children, to his or her child or children, and then fail to fulfill that promise. لا يصلح الكذب في جد ولا هزل ولا أن يعد أحدهم أحدكم ولده شيئا. Lies are of no use in either seriousness or jest. Also, it is not right for someone to promise something to his child, ثُمَّ لَا يُنْجِزُ لَهُ and then fail to fulfill the promise. Uh, <clears throat> in this particular narration, We have the statement of Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who was also Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, as we mentioned in the other narration, that it was Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he makes the statement that this lying, that falsehood, has no benefit whatsoever, it has no use whatsoever, when it is done, the jad. أو في هزل في جد ولا هزل that it has no benefit whatsoever and this lets us know once again the nature of lying the nature of not telling the truth the nature of lying and not telling the truth because we find the companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam following the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam in his statements, either saying directly what he said or paraphrasing what he said by bringing a statement from themselves. Uh, there are some occasions, and we mentioned earlier, <clears throat> that some of the Muslims have fallen into the, uh, the, disres the disrespectful uh, manner towards the Sharia or towards Islam of lying and joking when they lie. And we mentioned that there's another narration that is going to follow, inshallah ta'ala, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa uh, mentioned about people lying when they're joking. There's a, there's a narration that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that we have from his companion Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu وَأَبُوْ هُرَيْرَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى عَنْهُ said, قَالُوا يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ He said that the companion said, O Messenger of Allah, إِنَّكَ لَا تُتَاعِبُنَا You don't play with us. Or excuse me, you play with us. Indeed, you play with us. And the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنِّي لَا أَقُولُ إِلَّا حَقًا That I don't say anything but the truth. In other words, they were saying that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kana yuda'ibuhum that he used to play with them he used to joke with them he used to laugh with them but when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told jokes and when he played with the companions he did not do it except he told the truth unlike what we do today unlike what we do today um, and we mentioned this before the break during the first session that this is something that has become the habit of Muslims is to lie and to tell jokes when they lie and this is something that is not accepted when we find the narration of the Prophet ﷺ where he was warning the Muslims warning, warning the Muslims in those days and warning those who came after those companions that the Prophet ﷺ when he said وَيْلُ لِلَّذِي يُحَدِّثُ فَيَكْذِبْ لِيُدْحِكَ بِهِ الْقَوْمِ وَيْلُ لَهُ وَيْلُ لَهُ The Prophet ﷺ he said woe to the one who talks he says something and he, by saying something he lies and he does it لِيُدْحِكَ لِيُدْحِكَ بِهِ الْقَوْمِ he does it to make the people laugh. The, this statement of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, where he ended the narration by saying, "Wailun lahu, wailun lahu, woe unto him, woe unto him." He began the statement by saying, "Woe unto the one who does this," and then he ended it twice by saying, "Woe unto the one who does this." This statement of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, if you took away, if we took away the statement, "La yudhiku bihi al-qawm." To make the people laugh, it still shows that lying, when the person is joking or not, if the people laughed or not, is something that is considered a lie with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether they laugh or not, whether they were meant it or not. And this goes back to the statement of Abdullah ibn Abbas, the statement that we have in front of us, لا يصلح الكذب في جد ولا هزلن that lying does not benefit it does not give any benefit when either when a person is serious or joking so if someone says to a person for instance and as we mentioned earlier that this has become a habit of the Muslims someone says for instance the phone rings the phone rings and there's a brother who is as we say in America we use the word intended but the proper the proper term for it is engaged. A person is engaged to a, a woman. So this brother is intended to assist it. This is just an example. And we'll try to think of some others. And his friend answers his phone. And he says to the brother, when the phone rings, he says, Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum salam. And uh, then the brother says, when he hangs up, he says, oh no, I'll call back later. Uh, the brother will, will be here shortly. Or oh, he's in the bathroom. And the brother's actually in the bathroom. When the brother comes out of the bathroom, he says, who was at the call? He said, that was Sister Fatima. She was calling because she's, you know, she's madly in love with you and she can't wait until you get married. She can't wait for that date to come. You know, five weeks, in five weeks she'll be married and she, that was her calling. But it really wasn't her on the other end. He just did this as a joke. The person who does this is lying. This is a sin. This is a sin and it's not permissible to do this. Whether you whether fi jad or fi hazl, whether it is serious or joking. Another example. Uh, someone calls whom you may not want to talk to at the time. So you tell your child when they answer the phone, tell them I'm busy. But you're sitting right there doing nothing. Tell them I'm in the bathroom. Tell them that I'm uh, doing my homework. But you're sitting right there in front of them. If you tell your child to tell that person that, now you've committed two sins, at least. You've committed two sins at least. Number one, you have lied. And number two, you have instructed your children to lie. And you will probably, as the ulama have mentioned, if it doesn't stop, you will probably get the sin of your great, 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 great grandchildren. What do we mean by that? 
What we mean by that is, you have instilled a characteristic of evil in your child by making it comfortable for them to transmit lies. So your child is now going to teach their children that, and their children are going to teach their children that, and their children are going to teach their children that, and their children are going to teach their children that. Because they learned it from you. Because the children learn from us. So what kind of message do we think we're sending to our children when we tell them to tell someone a lie? Tell them I'm, I'm busy. Tell them I'm not here. Tell them I went down the hall to the laundry room. I'll be right back. So these types of things are not permissible. A brother says to you, you left your hat at my house and it was $100 in it. But it wasn't $100 in it. This is a lie. This is a lie. So these things we have to stay away from. Whether we are doing it seriously or whether we are doing it as a joke, we have to stay away from it. Because if we don't, then it becomes a part of our nature. We become comfortable. This is the meaning of وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا خُطُوَاتِ shaitan. Don't follow the footsteps of shaitan. Because shaitan comes khutwa khutwa. He comes khutwa bi khutwa. He comes step by step. He doesn't come with a big boulder. Boom! He comes with a little thing that he throws out there for you and then you implement it and you become comfortable with it. So it's just a teeny little lie in the form of a joke. And you tell another one, then you tell another one, then you tell another one, then you tell another one, حَتَّى يُكْتَبَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ كَذَّابًا until you are recorded with Allah as a liar, as a chronic liar. <clears throat> also in this particular statement of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "Wailu lilladhi yuhadithu fa yakdibu liyudhika bihi alqawm, wailu lahu, wailu lahu." Woe to the one who makes statements or who speaks, then lies, meaning while he's speaking, to make people laugh. To make people by way of that statement laugh. Wailun lahu, wailun lahu. The ulama of Islam, they differ on what is the meaning of wail. The ulama, they differ on what is the meaning of wail. Some of the ulama, they say that wail means la'na. May the person be cursed. And some of the ulama, they say that wail, the word that is used for woe unto that person, Woe unto him, woe unto him. Some of the ulama said that wail is the pus that exudes or comes from the people's bodies in the hellfire. The pus that comes out of the people who are being tortured in the hellfire, some of the ulama say that that is called wail. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best what the meaning of it is, but whatever it is, is something that we don't want. Is something that we want to keep away from ourselves. And the Prophet ﷺ, as we mentioned, he said it in the beginning of his statement, and then he said it two times at the end. Wailu lilladhi yuhaddithu fayakthibu. Woe unto the person. Wail unto the person who speaks. And when he speaks, he lies, and he does it to make the people laugh. There's a brother who I know, who has a habit of doing this, and he does it so much. He does it so much that the people have around him have become uh, comfortable with it and they, they actually expect him to do it. And this is something that we should try to stay away from. Then the Prophet ﷺ's companion, he said, Or that he promises his child something and then he fails to fulfill that promise. He promises his child something, and then he fails to fulfill that promise. The ulama say that this is haram. That this is haram. And the Prophet ﷺ, he didn't give permission to do this. There's no concession or permission from the Prophet ﷺ. And we have a narration, a hadith from Abdullah ibn Amr, رضي الله تعالى عنه وهي سيد دعتني أمي يوما ورسول الله قاعد في بيتنا صلى الله عليه وسلم فقالت ها تعال 
أعطيك فقال لها رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وما أردت أن تعطيه قالت وما أردت أن تعطيه قالت أعطيه تمرا فقال لها رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أما إنك لو لم تعطيه شيئا كتبت عليك كذبة كتبت عليك كذبة أخرجه أحمر وأبو داود عبد الله ابن عامر رضي الله تعالى عنه he said and he is the narrator of this narration he said my mother one day called me my mother one day called me while the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sitting in our house and she said then she said ha ta'al come here meaning to her son Abdullah ibn Amr radiyallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'in and then the messenger of Allah after she said come here I want to give you something I'm going to give you something so the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to her what is it that you have desired to give to him she said I'm going to give him some dates I'm going to give him a date a piece of fruit so the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to her, If you had not given him something, if you had not given him something, kutibat alayki kadiba, then one lie would have been written down for on upon you. One lie would have been written against you. How many times, brothers and sisters, without raising your hand, we don't want you to raise your hand and admit it. But how many of us, because you already know what you do, and Allah knows better than you, how many of us call our children because we want our children to come, we want our children to come to us, so we say, come here, come here, Abdullah, have some candy. I have some candy. And we don't have the candy. Abdullah, I have a slice of pie for you. And, Abdul, and Abdullah has no pie waiting for him. If we do this and we actually don't have that thing, then that will be a lie written down on our sleep. Because this is something that is in Islam is rejected because it is a form of deception. And Islam abhors deception. Islam abhors talbis, talbi, uh, tadris. And deception is something that the ulama of Islam, specifically the scholars of hadith, a person who is guilty of this, they reject that person, if they, they reject that narration if that person is in the hadith, in the chain of the hadith. This is one of the reasons why Muslim women can't wear wigs. This is one of the reasons why Muslim women can't wear weave in their hair. This is one of the reasons why Muslim women can't wear false eyelashes. This is one of the reasons why Muslim women can't wear false fingernails. This is one of the reasons why Muslim women can't wear high heel shoes or lifts inside their shoes. Lifts inside their shoes that makes them look taller than what they are. All of this is tedlis. It's all deception. It's a form of lying and Islam is opposed to this. Islam is opposed to this. Also we have the narration of Abdul Rahman ibn Abza who said Qala Dawood wa idha wa'adta sahibaka fa anjis lahu ma wa'adtahu fa in lam taf'al yuwarrithu baynaka wa baynahu adawa We have the statement of Abdul Abdul Rahman ibn Abza who said that Dawood said when you promise your friend or your companion when you promise your friend or your companion, meaning you promise to do something for them or to give them something, then you should give, fulfill that promise for them. You should do what you promised to do for him. For if you don't do that, it's going to germ, it's going to generate or produce enmity between you and him. It's going to produce enmity between you and him. And we have the statement of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he explained to us, he informed us that the one who doesn't keep his amana, he has no iman. And the one who doesn't keep his contracts has no deen. The one who doesn't keep his trust, 
has no iman, and the one who doesn't keep his his contracts, he has no deen. <clears throat> the next hadith that Imam al Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala brings under the section Alabi Yasbiru ala Adan Nas, those who are patient with the harm of the people. And we mentioned this last night, and we gave some details. Imam al Bukhari rahimahullah said, Allah haddathana Adam, Allah haddathana Shu'aba, عن الأعمش أن يحيى بن أن يحيى بني والثاب عن ابن عمر رضي الله تعالى عنهما ورضاهما عن النبي صلوات الله وسلامه عليه قال المؤمن الذي يخالط الناس ويصبر على آذاهم خير من الذي خير من الذي لا يخالط الناس ولا يصبر على آذاهم. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم companion Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma he reported that he sallallahu alayhi wasallam said a believer who has dealings with the people and endures their abuse the believer the believer that mixes with the people and he is patient with the harm of those people is better than the one who does not mix with the people and is not patient with their harm we mentioned this last night, and one of the brothers, he made a very nice point when we were asking the people for some benefits in this hadith. One of the benefits that the brother brought last night, he shows, he said that this hadith shows that the Muslim should be in good companionship with the other Muslims and should be mixing with the Muslims. It also shows, as the ulama have mentioned, that this narration is talking about the people of the sunnah. It's not talking about the people of innovations, the people of, of heresies, the people of shirk and kufr. It's not talking about those people. It's talking about the people of the sunnah who abuse you. The people of the sunnah that abuse you. They may backbite you. They may slander you. They may abuse you. They may revile you. You don't run away from them, but rather you, you mix with them and you try to be patient with the harm that they come with. And this goes back to the Prophet ﷺ statement, لا يصاحبك إلا مؤمن ولا يأكل تعامك إلا تقي That you should not allow anyone to be your companion except that he's a believer, and you should not any allow the person to eat your food except that he is righteous. Except that he is righteous. So that the people who you are not going to allow to be around you, or you're not going to feed them with your food, the only way that you can do this, is to practice the, the, this particular hadith, with regards to the people who are the sunnah, is that you are mixing with them. And even if some people give you some harm, then you have to be patient with them, as the Prophet wasallam was patient with those people, was patient with those people, who used to revile him, and used to slander him and used to backbite him, or used to slander him, and used to say things, abusive things to him, and do abusive things to him. So in this narration, the Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Mu'min, the believer. He didn't say Al-Muslim. He said, Al-Mu'min, al-ladhi yukhalitu nas wa yasbiru ala adahum khayrun min al-ladhi la yukhalitu nas wa la yasbiru ala adahum that the, Muslim, the believer who mixes with the people and is patient with their harm is better than the Muslim who does not mix with the people and is patient with their harm. And we mentioned also last night that when the Muslim who is upon the sunnah, who is upon da'wah to salafiyyah, he harms you, then you should follow the instructions of the Prophet ﷺ and sticking with those Muslims even though they are abusive to you. And not go to the places where the people who are not upon the sunnah, as we mentioned last night, how are you going to leave the masjid of the people of Ahl sunnah just because there are some people who don't treat you the way you would like to be treated or the way that you should be treated, to go to a place where the people are sitting in the dark, in the basement of the masjid, holding hands and screaming like dogs in some vicar circle. How you, because they treat you better on the other side of town. Or some people who are followers of this woman, Amina Wadud. Oh, they treat you good over there. Oh, yes, they, they come and visit me when I'm sick. 
And when I need help with my telephone bill, they help me. But these are not the people of the sunnah. So it's better for you to be patient with the harm of those Muslims who are upon the sunnah, who are upon the salafiyyah. It's better for you to be patient with their harm and mix with them than to run away from them. On the other side of the coin, we who are abusing those people should change our ways and correct our character and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who are true to our word and true to our message of this da'wah. Because the Prophet ﷺ, he told us, بَشِّرُوا وَلَا تُنَفِّرُوا يَسِّرُوا وَلَا تُعَسِّرُوا Be bringers of glad tidings and don't run the people away. Be easy on the people and don't be harsh. And this is something that our beloved Mashaykh have been saying a lot these days about. Our Shaykh Abdul Musan al-Abbad and Shaykh Muhammad ibn Hadi al-Madkhali and Shaykh Rabi ibn Hadi al-Madkhali and Shaykh Ubaid al-Jabri and others. They've been pushing home and hitting home this point and they've been mentioned, they've been really pressing it that we have to get rid of these actions of extremism and harshness and being intolerant with people and not being patient with the people and not being forbearing with the people. This is something that we should get rid of our, from our character because it is something that is very damaging. <clears throat> the next statement or next hadith that Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah brings under the section As-Sabr ala al-Adha Qala haddathana musaddad Qala haddathana Yahya ibn Sa'id an Sufyan Qala haddathani al-A'mash an Sa'id ibn Jubair an Abi Abdurrahman an Abi Abdurrahman al-Sulami an Abi Musa an al-Nabi salawatu Allahi wa salamu alayhi qal ليس أحد أو ليس, أو ليس شيء أصبر على أذى يسمعه من الله عز وجل إنهم ليدعون له ولدا وأنه ليعافيهم ويرزقهم أو كما قالوا صلى الله عليه وسلم أبو موسى رضي الله تعالى عنه he reported that the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said no one or no thing is more patient with the abuse he hears than Allah. No one or no thing is more patient with the abuse he hears than Allah. Some people even ascribe a son to him, and yet he grants them good and provides them with sustenance. And yet he grants them good or provides them with sustenance. Here we like to go back to the format we had last night, last night, because I'm sure Wallahu Ta'ala A'lam wa'ala that many of you have probably never heard this hadith before. And this is a tremendous narration. So we're going to go back to the to the format that we had last night for this specific hadith. And we want to go around the room, inshaAllah ta'ala, and ask the brothers. What are some of the benefits that we gain from this hadith? And we'll read it again, inshallah, for those of you who didn't catch it. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لَيْسَ أَحَدٌ أَوْ لَيْسَ شَيْءٌ أَصْبَرَ عَلَىٰ أَذَىٰ يَسْمَعُهُ مِنَ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ إِنَّهُ لَيَدَّعُونَ لَهُ وَلَدًا وَأَنَّهُ لَيُعَافِيهِمْ وَيَرْزُقُهُمْ No one or no thing is more patient with the abuse, with the abuse and the harm he hears than Allah. Some people even ascribe a son to him, and yet he grants them good and provides them with sustenance. We want the brothers at the raise of a hand, inshallah, to bring some of the fawaid, some of the benefits from this narration. Anybody? No, fadl. Now, the brother is making this a very good point of, of benefit. The brother is saying that this hadith clearly shows that even though some of the people, like the Christians, and also there are some of the Jews who also do the same thing, that they ascribe to Allah a son, Subhana. They ascribe to Allah a son. And even though they ascribe a son to Allah, which is one of the most reprehensible things that a person can do, which is one of the most reprehensible things that a human being can do is to ascribe to the beneficent, Ar-Rahman, a son. 
He still provides them. He still gives them food, etc. No. No. Another benefit from the narration. No. Fadl. No. The brother is saying, MashaAllah. The brother is giving as a benefit from this an attribute that's a, a, a description that is attributed to Allah. And that attribute is patience. And of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's patience is a perfect patience. And there's no patience like Allah's patience. So we don't say that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is patient and I'm patient and our patience are equal. Or our patience is like Allah's patience. Or Allah's patience is like His creature's patience. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ There is none like Him. There is none like Him. Nothing like Him. And Allah is the all here. Allah is the all here, And is the all seer. But this, is, this hadith is a proof that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has patience. But we do not ascribe the attribute of patience to Allah similar to the description of patience that a human being has. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's nothing like him, and وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدْ And there's nothing comparable to him. Anyone else of another benefit from this narration? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears everything. Without confusion. Yeah, the brother is making the point that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he hears everyone, but he doesn't hear everyone with confusion. Like he, the brother is saying, he gives the example that if one or two people are talking, another person is talking, you can't hear everybody clearly at the same time. It's, in, it's impossible. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he hears his creatures. And this narration is another proof of another attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of another attribute of Allah azza wa jal. Any, any, anything else from the benefits from this narration? And there are many. There are many benefits in this narration. Anything else? No, fadl. Yeah, the, the point that the brother is making, which is a comment on this, a side comment on this, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's patience is with them in this life. But as for the next life, they're going to be punished. It's finished. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is patient, meaning going back to what the brother said in the beginning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down the rain for them, just like He sends down the rain on the believers. He allows the food to come out of the ground, the, the vegetation, just like He does for the believers. So these types of things He gives to, the, to those kuffar, even though they are ascribing a son to Him. Now, Yes, the brother is making another good point as a benefit that this hadith shows once again, of course, our sabr, our patience is not like Allah's patience. But it also shows that we should be patient with the people who when they harm us, when the people harm us and they abuse us, that we should be patient. And we mentioned earlier and we're saying it again, especially the people who are involved with da'wah. The person who is involved with da'wah on a regular basis, he or she needs to understand that this is an occupational hazard. Being harmed by the tongues of the people, being harmed by the physical hands of the people, goes along with the territory. I can't even tell you, brothers and sisters, how many times people have lied on me in my effort to try to spread this word. People who hate Salafia, and I know them, and I know them. There are people who I know that hate Salafia. They hate this Tao. And they hate the people who are spreading this Tao. Some of the things that they have said about me. I'll give you an example, just one example. Just outside earlier when we took the break, just about 35, 40 minutes ago, one of the brothers said something that is on the East Coast, and now I hear it's on this side, that Saudi Arabia put me out of the country and I can never go back, not even for Hajj or Umrah. Not even for Hajj or Umrah. That Dawud ad was thrown out of Saudi Arabia for backbiting and slandering. That was one version. The other version, the brother told me another version, on this, on, in this part of the United States is another version. There's, I've heard about four different versions. That Dawud ad was thrown out of Saudi Arabia, that he was taken to the Sharia court. He was taken to the Sharia court to be whipped. To be whipped. He was thrown out of Saudi Arabia, never to return. He can't even make Umrah or Hajj. 
These are some of the things that the people, when they hate the Dawah, and they hate the people who are promoting the Dawah, they'll lie on you, they'll, they'll backbite you, they'll slander you, they'll fabricate things on you. All kinds of things. And there are many, many, many examples I can give just for me specifically and even the other brothers who I know who are involved in this Dawah. We're just making this point not to be questions, inshallah. We're just making this point so that the people can understand that whoever, whoever is involved with the Dawah, that they have to understand, like Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, that they are going to be harmed. You are going to be harmed. Either you're going to be harmed by the people's tongues, or you're going to be harmed by the people's hands. You may even be physically put in the hospital, and you may even be killed. At the hands of Muslims. At the hands of Muslims. So we have to be patient with the harm. And this is why Shaykh al-Islam, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, in his book, Thalathatul Usul, he brings the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَالْعَصْرُ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانِ لَا فِي خُسْرُ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاسَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاسَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ Allah swears by the time that surely every human being is going to be a loser except those who believe and do righteous deeds and they exhort one another and enjoin one another and encourage one another and invite one another to the truth and they encourage and exhort one another to being patient, meaning being patient with the harm that they're going to receive at the hands of the disbelievers and at the hands of the Muslims who don't understand the Sunnah and Salafiyya and don't understand the Dawah Salafiyya. <clears throat> also, are there any more benefits that the brothers see of this narration? Naam, faddal. MashaAllah, ahsant. Ahsant. This is a very, very good point. This narration also shows, Barakallahu fihi. May Allah bless the brother and all of you. This narration also shows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His kindness and His mercy exceeds His punishment and His wrath. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is patient with the people. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, even though they're abusing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and even though they're harming Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with these statements of shirk, of polytheism, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He doesn't follow up, in this life that is, He doesn't follow up these things with a bad, with a bad deed, or with, a, with, a, with something evil against those people. Even though there are cases where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and because the kuffar, this is their jannah, he will, he will have some trial sent to them. But in general, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not do this to his creatures. And this is another benefit that we get. In addition to what the brother just said, when the statement of the Prophet sallallahu says that Allah is harmed, it doesn't mean that Allah is affected by that. We should understand that. When we say Allah is harmed, it doesn't mean that Allah is affected by that. Any more benefits that we see from this narration? There's one glaring, glaring benefit that no one has, bring, has brought up so far. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides everything. That's another one. Inna Allah huwa ar-razzaq dhu dhu quwwatul mateen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ar-razzaq. He is the provider and He is the owner of Al-Quwa, and that Quwa is Mateen. That Quwa, that power is firm. It's mighty. But there's another point, a very, very important point, that is not being mentioned. Now, yes, that Allah is being harmed once again, and of course Allah is not being affected by that harm, and we're being harmed, but we should, be, we should, be, we should, be, we should bear that harm with forbearance. We should bear that harm with a forbearance. Now, and I hope that's what you said. And Allah is not pleased that a son is ascribed to him. That's another benefit. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not pleased with a son being ascribed to him. And it's very interesting that in this narration, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went all the way to the most oppressive thing. Because this saying that Allah has a son is a form of oppression. This is oppression. This is a zulm. And the ulama of Islam, they say that zulm, which is commonly translated as oppression, is of three types. 
Vulm is of three types. The first type of vulm or oppression is against Allah. The second type of oppression is against yourself. You oppress yourself. The third type of oppression is oppressing someone else. The oppression against Allah, the vulm against Allah is shirk. Ascribing a partner to Allah. Saying that Allah has a mother. Saying that Allah has a son. Saying that Allah has a father. Saying that Allah has a partner. The second type of oppression is when you oppress yourself. When you place a burden on yourself that you cannot bear. When you pray, place a, 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 a matter on yourself, a burden that you cannot bear. And the third type of oppression is when you oppress someone other than yourself. And the worst type of that type of oppression is to kill someone without justification. To take the life of a human being, Muslim or Kafir. Muslim or Kafir. That you don't have the right to take. This is the worst type of oppression the ulama like Shaykh Ruthaymeen have mentioned towards the human being. So when the person is oppressing Allah, they're saying things like Allah has a mother. And Allah has a son. And these are things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates. And it's very interesting once again that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he brought it all the way up to the most reprehensible thing that a person can do, which is to say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a son. The glaring thing? We didn't get to it yet. We wait for somebody to say it. Hmm? The narration again for the brother so he can bring that glaring benefit. No one or no thing is more patient with the abuse he hears than Allah. Some people even ascribe a son to him and yet he grants them good and provides them with sustenance. Anybody see that benefit? There's another benefit here. A serious benefit. Huh? Are you permitted? Yes, sir. You need to have a microphone. The Prophet he pointed to that aspect of the Prophet he mentioned in this hadith, in this narration, and that, uh, that they ascribe a son, that they ascribe a son to him, which is, of course, the the sin that if a person does it and they die upon it, they will go to Jahannam or Iyadu Billah. So now, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet sallallahu he said that he grants them good and he grants them benefit, showing that the good and the benefit is only temporal, it's only in this life, because no way can a person... Uh, ascribe a partner to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the good and the benefit will be also in the akhirah. So the benefit that we get from this is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is pointing to that that kabiran, that great sin that has been ascribed, that they ascribe a partner to him in spite of that know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them good and benefit but also the point of benefit is to know that that, that benefit and that good is only in this life it does not go to the hereafter at all. Now, you got that? Huh? Yes, the brother is saying istidraj. The brother is saying in, in light of what uh, Abu Dawood, the Imam, has mentioned, the brother is saying istidraj. And istidraj, for those who don't know what istidraj is, istidraj is when Allah from his, one of the sunnah, one of the sunnahs of Allah, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows the servant, the slave, in this life, in the dunya, to... Uh, to be increased in the worldly things even though that person is disobedient. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا رَأَيْتَ اللَّهَ يُعْتِي إِذَا رَأَيْتَ اللَّهَ تَعَالَ يُعْتِي عَلَى الْعَبْدِ مَا يُحِبُّهُ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا وَهُمْ مُقِيمُونَ عَلَيْهِ فَإِنَّهُ فَذَلِكَ إِنَّهُ إِسْتِدْرَاجِ أو كَمَنْ قَالَهُ صلى الله عليه وسلم That if you see Allah conferring if you see Allah conferring on His servant who's being disobedient to Him, you walking around your shoes, you only got one pair of shoes, and you being a righteous servant to Allah, you fast on Mondays and Thursdays, you stand up at night, you tell the truth, 
you, will, you, you do the things of the sunnah, and you, you need money, you don't have shoes, your water's leaking in your house, and you see this Muslim that you know is selling drugs. The brother's selling drugs. The sister's committing all kinds of heinous, abominable acts. And you keep seeing them being uh, given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more clothes and more cars and more money and their house is real nice and your house is falling apart. This is called istidraj. Allah is allowing them to pile up those things in the dunya as we say in English and here in America giving them more rope to hang themselves. This is the way Allah gives the person more rope to hang themselves. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in his book, that when they were reminded of that which they forgot, فَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ أَبْوَابَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ That we opened the floodgates, everything of goodness for them. Everything of goodness for them. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala snatches them, without them knowing it. Snatches them and they become dumbfounded. But there's one thing here that's mentioned in this narration. No one got it yet, right? I'll read it one more time. Now, being patient with being patient with the commandments of Allah, uh huh, and being patient with staying, staying away from being disobedient to Allah. And this is exactly what the ulama say. They said that sabr, that patience is of three types. Patience is of three types. One, being patient with the commandments of Allah. The second is being patient with the prohibitions, meaning stay away from the prohibitions. Staying away from prohibitions. And the third one is being patient with what Allah has decreed. Staying away from the thing, being patient with the things that Allah has decreed. I will read this one more time. And I'll read it in Arabic for the Arabic speaking brothers. So maybe they'll catch the hint. Inshallah. لَيْسَ أَحَدٌ أَوْ لَيْسَ شَيْءٌ أَصْبَرَ عَلَىٰ أَذَىٰ يَسْمَعُهُ مِنَ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ إِنَّهُ لَيَدَّعُونَ لَهُ وَلَدًا وَإِنَّهُ لَيُعَافِيهِمْ وَيَرْزُقُهُمْ No one or no thing is more patient with the abuse he hears than Allah. Some people even ascribe a son to him, and yet he grants them good and provides them with sustenance. Did anybody catch it? That the Prophet Sallallahu he's saying that Allah, that Allah's Prophet Sallallahu is mentioning in this hadith that inanimate things can, uh, are even being patient. So what's the proof in the hadith that inanimate things are being patient? The word shade. Is he right, brothers? Laysa ahadun aw laysa shay'un asbar ala al-adha there's no one or no thing. Is the brother right when he says this? When he says inanimate things, and his proof is that the prophet said no thing. No one or no thing. The brother's saying here in Arabic in front of us, he said that the word shay or thing in Arabic indicates or in, uh, indicates something that is an inanimate object. Is that correct? You agree? That's not correct. No, not in this hadith. In this hadith, this is a proof that you can say Allah is a thing. That's the benefit. That's the glaring benefit we get in this hadith. Why? Because Allah says, and the brother who was a hafiz, I believe, in front of me will correct me. Allah says, قُلْ أَيُّ شَيْءٍ أَكْبَرُ shahada." قُلِ اللَّهِ Allah says, Say to them, O Muhammad Sallallahu which thing is the greater as a testimony? They say to them, it is Allah. So Allah in the Qur'an and the ulama of Ahl sunnah wal Jama'ah, they say from this, it proves that you can say that Allah is a thing. But, of course, yeah, you get a half point, yes. But of course... Uh, and for those who want to know more details about this, you can read the book called Al-Qawa'id al-Muthla, 
the exemplary, exemplary uh, attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the principles pertaining to that from Shaykh Muhammad ibn Salih al Uthaymeen, where he mentions these things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, sifat, he has asma, and there are things of akhbar that he informs us of. There's neither an attribute or a name. And one of them is Allah is a thing. Allah is a thing. And we have the verse in the Quran, and we also have this hadith, and there are other hadith that are similar to this, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being described, and we're using it in a loose sense of the word, as a thing. That's the glaring benefit we get in this hadith. No. That's right. That's right. We, the brother is saying that Imam al Bukhari ahsant. Imam al Bukhari brings in, and he said chapter, but actually book. The book Kitab al-Tawheed in Sahih al-Bukhari, which is the last chapter, the last book, the last book in Sahih al-Bukhari, the book of Tawheed. The brother said he brings, Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah, brings a chapter in that book, Kitab al-Tawheed, in his Sahih, where Allah, he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a thing, and then he brings another narration where he mentions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a thing. And that's one of the benefits, one of the, the last benefit that we mentioned from this hadith. Now, oh. yes. Hmm? That who? Oh, yes, yes. The brother's saying, and this is, uh, it's, it's implicit. Not explicit. The brother is implying that uh, two of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one is Ar-Rahman, Yarhamakum Allah. And one is Ar-Rahim. One is Ar-Rahman and one is Ar-Rahim. And the ulama, they say that one of those names specifically deals with the, dis- the believers and the disbelievers in terms of mercy. And the other one specifically deals with the mercy, the mercy for, the, for the believers and beneficence and compassion for the believers. And this is absolutely true and it's implied in this particular hadith. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Now, uh, we're going to end it here, inshallah. We have about 10 minutes left for questions that revolve around the topic. And uh, if there are no questions revolving around the topic, then, inshallah, we'll take the... Uh, those that are general. But the, the, the policy was, or the, the policy is that we're writing these things down. We're writing them on pieces of paper and we're sending them up. And this is the policy. So inshallah, if you can do that, we'd appreciate it. And be patient with us. <clears throat> Help me understand uh, how... No. Help me understand how we know that Allah is a thing, is of a benefit. No, we're not saying that that is a benefit. We're saying that that's a benefit in the hadith to let us know that Allah has been mentioned as a thing. That's what we're saying. It's information. It's information. Right. Like, for instance, if someone says, uh, if someone thinks that someone made a mistake when they said the only person that, that is perfect is Allah. Right? You, you follow me? Would you say that's a mistake? Huh? You say that was a mistake? You said it's not a mistake. The brothers over here say, okay. You say it's not a mistake and they say it is... Right, but you didn't hear what a statement I made. What's the problem with what I just said? Because I refer to Allah as a person. So the only person that's perfect is Allah. Right? But now, do you agree with them? Okay, but now we have more than one narration that's authentic where Allah is called a person. Yeah. We have more than one hadith that's authentic, I said. I said authentic, more than one, where Allah's Prophet ﷺ called Allah shakhs, called him a person. 
You're right, subhanAllah, you're right. <laughs> That's right, you're absolutely right. <laughs> Subhanallah. And Allah, subhanallah means Allah is far above any imperfections and defects. No. After we finish with these, inshallah, as we mentioned. No. So what's the benefit? The benefit is in that narration, the narration in front of us, is that Allah, we've been informed that Allah is a thing. Right? That Allah is a thing. Allah mentions in the Quran, this is enough for us. Hmm? Shaks know in the hadith. But the, the, the sunnah is revelation. The revelation came down in two parts the Quran and the sunnah. So if the Prophet said it, it's all that's it. It's revelation. Now, and there are, many, there are many examples like this. There's a hadith from the Prophet that Shaykh al Albani brings in his silsila, where he, Allah, the Prophet called Allah. At Tabib. He called Allah Tabib, the doctor. He called Allah a doctor. The Prophet ﷺ had something wrong with his back. And the man said, Let me fix it for you. I can, let me look at it. I can take care of it. I'm a doctor. He said, Allahu at Tabib. He said, Allah is a doctor. Right? So there are many examples like this. And they're authentic. Authentic. Um, is that it? And once again, um, these things can be uh, for further uh, explanation of these principles of names and attributes. You can find the book uh, published by Troyd uh, uh, and translated by our brother. Uh, may Allah reward him and increase him in good. Musa Richardson Abu Abbas. Uh, and the book is written by Sheikh Muhammad ibn Salih al Uthaymeen. It is called uh, Exemplary Names or something like this. Exemplary attributes of Allah. al qawadu Mufla. And these things are mentioned. I think we have about four minutes left. Uh, the sisters, they don't have any questions from the other sister, side, right? Sister, this this Actually, uh, for tomorrow, we have two hadiths left. And then, alhamdulillah, we're right on time. We have two hadiths, actually four hadiths left in this uh, section of Al-Adab al-Mufrad. Two of the hadiths are, 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 are da'if, they're not authentic, and two of them are authentic. So inshallah, we'll finish them tomorrow, inshallah. Um, either sound or other than sound, because there are different classifications of authentic hadith. No. Right. The hadith number five and six that are unauthentic, but Sheikh Al Albani mentioned the authentic, mentioned the authentic Al Adab al Mufrad. Uh, the brother is mentioning, he's saying, he's, he's making a statement that we mentioned yesterday that the fifth and the sixth hadith in this section are unauthentic. Uh, and he says, but Shaykh al-Albani mentioned the authentic al-adab al-mufrad. Yes, he's absolutely right. The brother is right that Shaykh al-Albani, he mentioned al- and he has an authentic al-adab al-mufrad, but he also has an unauthentic al-adab al-mufrad. Shaykh al-Albani took al-adab al-mufrad and he made sahih and da'if. Sahih is like thick like that. And the da'if one is about uh, maybe like this, this thin, like that. And those two hadiths, of two, these two hadiths, he said they are not authentic. When we, be, when we believers take punishment for being upon Salafiyyah, take punishment for being upon Salafiyyah, does that mean that we should turn our face and take it on the other side? <laughs> no, we're not saying that you should turn the other cheek. But we're saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, He is the one who is, al, who is Al-Halim. He is Al-Halim. He is the one who is clement. He is the one who pardons people. 
when they abuse him and when they harm him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who was also one who was tolerant with the people. So if the people abuse you, try to be patient with them. Try to be patient with them. Because many people, many people are just ignorant. I'm always telling the brothers, for instance, I'm always telling the brothers that I know quite a few people who don't like Dawah to Salafiyya, but they like me. I know quite a few people like this. They like Brother Dawud Adi, but they don't like Dawud al Salafiyya. And they'll listen to me, and they won't listen to other people because they like me. Likewise, we have people who will harm us because they don't like either one. I don't care if the people don't like me, but it is a sin upon you if you don't like Dawud al Salafiyya. If you don't like this Dawah that's calling to the Book of Allah and the authentic Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah والسلام, the way the companions and the Tabi'un understood it along with the third generation, if you don't like that, then that's a serious problem. Not liking Dawud ad is no problem. That's no big thing because I'm nobody. I'm no one. And I'm sure that the, the people of... Uh, other than uh, the people who like to make war on the Dawah, when they hear that, they'll agree. <laughs> when I said that I'm no one, I'm nothing, I'm sure they'll agree with that. But so, when, we, when people abuse us, it's not, we're not saying to turn the other cheek, but we're saying be patient with the harm. Be patient with the harm. I think we have one minute left. We'll save these, inshallah. What time is it? Okay, we, we can finish. We have one minute left? Two minutes? You can use five minutes for this. Inshallah. The first general question, and we're going to end it here with no more questions, inshallah. The first general question is, can you elaborate on the importance of the wives, the women, also putting forth strong effort to seek knowledge and read books? Basically, there's nothing we really need to say about this. Whatever is being said by the Prophet ﷺ to the men is being said equally to the women. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He doesn't leave out the reward of anyone. Whether they're dhakr or untha, whether they're male or female, He's not going to let be lost the deeds or the actions of anyone, whether they're male or female. Allah mentions this all through His book. In fact, Um Salama, Um Salama, the wife of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she asked the question one time, how come we don't hear anything about the women in the Qur'an? You know? How come we don't hear anything about the women? What are women going to do? We're of the women. What are women? What about, what about the women? And then Allah revealed that ayah, إِنَّ الْمُسْلِمِينَ وَالْمُسْلِمَاتِ وَالْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ وَالْقَانِتِينَ وَالْقَانِتَاتِ وَالصَّادِقِينَ وَالصَّادِقَاتِ All the way to the end of the verse. وَالذَّاكِرِينَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرٌ وَالذَّاكِرَاتِ أَعَدَّ اللَّهُ لَهُمْ مَغْفِرَةً وَأَجْرًا عَظِيمًا Surely those from the male and female Muslims, from the male and female believers, from the male and female pious, from the male and female who tell the truth, all the way down to those of the males and females who remember Allah much, Allah has promised them a great reward and forgiveness from Himself. So they're going to get a, the women are going to get a great reward also if they strive to make the effort of learning, getting ilm. If they do this, they will definitely get rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all they have to do is just read what Allah says about the men. I mean, what Allah says in general is to the men and to the women. I read an article that said hijab and niqab or the hellfire. This article came from Salafi.com. The article basically... Uh, maybe they meant to say, I read an article that says the person that doesn't wear the hijab or niqab are in the hellfire. This article came from Salafi.com. The article basically said if a woman does not wear niqab, that they are going to hell. Can you elaborate on this? I can't elaborate on it because I don't know it. But it's definitely not true that if a woman doesn't wear niqab, uh, she's going to go to hell. And let's, let's make up, we need to clarify something right now. The ulama of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, they are divided into two camps. 
with regards to the woman covering the face and the hands totally or with regards to uncovering the face and uncovering the hands. We need to make a clarification right now. The ulama are divided into two camps. The ulama past and the ulama present. And some of the Muslims who have taken the second position or the first position, depending upon what side of the room you're standing on and how you're looking at it, some of the Muslims who take the position from the, from the Dawah, people who are Sunni, Salafi, who take the position that the woman's face must be covered, and they say the Sheikh bin Baz and Sheikh Luthaymeen say, and there are other ulama from the kingdom of Saudi Arabia who say this, they're making a serious mistake, a serious mistake. Then what is that mistake? That mistake is that they're saying that Sheikh bin Baz and Sheikh Luthaymeen and the likes of them and Sheikh Mukbil and the likes of them, Rahimahumullahu jami'an, are saying that you have to wear the niqab. Sheikh bin Baz and Sheikh Ruthaymeen and Sheikh Mukbil Lima never said this. They never ever said this. What they said is, is that the entire face has to be covered. So those people who have the position that Sheikh, they use Sheikh bin Baz and, and others of the ulama of Salafiyyah to say that the woman's face has to be covered, yes, that's right. But when the Sheikh, when those Mashaikh say that the face has to be covered and the hands have to be covered, they don't mean with the eyes missing, with the, excuse me, with the eyes being exposed, they mean everything has to be covered. So the statements that you're using from them saying that you have to have your face covered, you are wrong when you attribute that to them because that's not their position. Their position is not the niqab. Their position is everything on that woman has to be covered. And people are making a serious mistake. They keep saying niqab, niqab, niqab. Niqab is not what Sheikh bin Baz meant. Sheikh Mukbil did not mean the niqab. Sheikh Luthaymeen did not mean the niqab. They meant the burqa. That's what they meant. The burqa, where everything is covered. Now when you start from that point, then we have a conversation. Then we can talk. If you want to start at that point, because that's what they meant. They did not mean that the woman's face is covered, her eyes are out, and her hands don't have any gloves on. No, that's not what they meant. To what extent do you deal with a Muslim that openly commits sins and refuses nasiha? Keep giving them nasiha, keep giving them nasiha, and if their sins are sins that affect the ummah, then you stay away from them. What is the permissible distance and length of time that a woman can travel with no mahram? For example, can sisters travel from New York City to Baltimore and stay two or three days? Or would they have to leave New York City and drive to Baltimore every morning for a conference, for instance? Sheikh Yahya al-Hajuri, Hafizahullah ta'ala, who inherited the students, the thousands of students in Sheikh Mukbil's camp and his camp, he inherited the camp. Sheikh Yahya al-Hajuri, and inshallah, we hope to translate this book very soon, wrote a very nice book. A very beneficial book on traveling, on the principles of traveling, the legal rulings of traveling, and he has a very nice two-page section on women traveling. The issue is not the days. The issue is traveling without a mahram when she's traveling. For if her husband doesn't want her to go to the other side of town without a mahram, he can do that. It's not an issue of going to New York. It's not an issue of going to Mississippi. If her husband doesn't want her to go to the other side of Chicago, from the north to the south, without a mahram, he can do that. Because the bottom line is protection. It has nothing to do with days. Because when you look at the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned one day in one narration, two days in another narration when another lady came to him, three days in another one. So somebody could get slick if they wanted to and choose one of those three hadiths. One day, two days, three days. But that's not the intent in the hadith. The intent in the hadith is, number one, what is considered traveling? And number two, you can't do that travel without a mahram. You cannot do it. You cannot do it. Because if it was an issue of days, we have the Concord. We can go to England in less than five hours. On the Concord, we can go to the Concord, we can get on the Concord airplane right now and be in London at Heathrow Airport in less than two hours. 
Can a woman do that? No, not by herself, unless she's a follower of Amina Wadud. <laughs> On the etiquettes of the woman, it states, don't treat your urban wife like a rural wife. And don't treat your rural wife like an urban wife. In the community we live in, there is no Arabic teaching, but at the Hizbi Masjid, there is Arabic classes. Is it okay to learn from them? As I am hesitant to take anything from them. Uh, as for the statement, um, don't treat your urban wife like a rural wife, I've never heard this before. I've never heard this before. Which doesn't mean that it's not true. Because Imam al-Shafi'i, rahimahullah, he said, which of us can say that there's a sunnah that has never has not escaped him? There's not one of us that can say that there's a sunnah that hasn't escaped him. So, I don't know all of the sunnah, and I don't know all of the hadiths. Nowhere near it. But I've never heard of this hadith before. I've never heard it. If this is a hadith, I don't know. As for learning Arabic from the people of deviation, the ulama have explained this. If you want the answer for this, you can go to www.bekka, B-A-K-K-A-H dot net. The answer is there, inshallah. Sheikh Ubaid al jabri has explained it. Should we be happy that we are going through the test since we know that it, Allah loves a person, that He tests him? Yes, we should be happy. We should be happy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing us. And the last question is, what is Salafiyya? What is Salafiyya? And this is a question that probably was written by Abu Dawood, but I'm going to answer it anyway. <laughs> Salafiyya is Islam. And Islam is Salafiyya. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in his book, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu dukhulu fi silmi kaffa wa la tattabi'u khutuwat shaytan إِنَّهُ لَكُمْ عَدُوٌ مُبِينٌ O you who believe, enter into Islam in its entirety. Enter into Islam in its entirety. Some people translate it as wholeheartedly. When you go back to the tafsir, it means enter into Islam in its entirety. Salafiyya is to understand and implement the Qur'an upon the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah with the understanding of our rightly guided predecessors. No one sitting here will disagree that we have to follow the Qur'an and the sunnah. No one, I'm sure, will disagree that we have to follow the Qur'an and the sunnah. But the disagreement comes when we have the understanding of the Qur'an and sunnah. Some of it is sahih and some of it is saqeem. Sometimes our understanding of the Qur'an and the Sunnah is a healthy understanding. And sometimes our understanding of the Qur'an and the Sunnah is an is a unhealthy or ill understanding. And the majority of the times, our understanding and implementation of the Qur'an and the Sunnah is unhealthy. So this is where that third pillar comes in. That third pillar comes in, which is the companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. How is it that a person can say they believe in Islam, they believe in the Quran, they believe in the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in beliefs, and not follow the practical implementation and application of the Quran that they say they believe in and the Sunnah that they say that they practice as implemented by the companions of the Messenger of Allah? How can they do that? It's just, it, it, it just amazes me. Salafiyya is the correct way to understand and practice the Qur'an and the Sunnah. How could it be that Muslims say they follow the Qur'an and the Sunnah, but when it comes to their political affairs, they follow Maududi? How can you say that you follow the Qur'an and Sunnah, and you believe the way companions believe, but when it comes to your political affairs, you're going to follow the teachings of Sayyid Qutb or Abdullah Azzam, or people who have led people astray. How? How? How are you saying that you're going to have an economic program, 
that you believe in Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you follow that way, but you're going to leave off the economic system that the companions established and follow someone else's economic program that you learned in some university here in America. How? So the way Salafiyyah is to follow the way of the Salaf. It is to follow the way of our rightly guided predecessors. It is to follow the way that they understood it and they practiced it. And this is why Allah says in that ayah, as Shaykh al-Albani and Shaykh Abd al-Muhsan al-Abbad and other great ulama living and dead have said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ يُشَاقِقِ الرَّسُولِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَتَّبِعْ غَيْرَ السَّبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ نُوَلِّهِ مَا تَوَلَّى وَنُسْلِهِ جَهَنَّمَا وَسَاءَتْ مَصِيرًا Whoever opposes the messenger, after the guidance has been made clear to him, and he follows a way other than the believers, we will leave him to that which he turned to, and cast him into the hellfire, a hapless journey's end. Allah didn't have to say, وَيَتَّبِعْ غَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ and follows a way other than the believers. Why did Allah put in the in- interior of that ayah, in the middle of that verse, and follows a way other than the believers? Who are the believers in that verse? In fact, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the believers in the Qur'an, who in the world do you think he's talking about? You? You think he's talking about you? He's talking about them. All those verses that says the believers, the believers, the believers, the believers, the believers. He's talking about them. So how is it that we can accept the way they believed and not accept the way they practiced? How is it that we can accept the way they believe and practice Islam other than a way that the people who are living right there, when the verse came down, when Allah, when the people came to the Prophet ﷺ and asked the Prophet, يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْمَحِيبُ and they ask you about menstruation. The Prophet will be silent. He wouldn't say anything. He wouldn't say anything. Why? Because the Prophet didn't speak without knowledge. Somebody would ask him a question, they ask you, O Muhammad, about menstruation. The Prophet would stop, wouldn't say anything. Sometimes he would look up like this, and he would look down. And then he would answer the question. Say that it is other, it is a harm. So stay away from the women when they have their menses. Those companions were there when those verses came down. Those companions were eating with the Prophet, drinking with the Prophet, sleeping with the Prophet, riding with the Prophet, fighting with the Prophet, dying for the Prophet. How is it that you can reject the statement? of Abdullah ibn Abbas or Ibn Mas'ud or Abu Bakr or Omar or any of the Sahaba for the statement of somebody living today. So the people of Salafiyya and Salafiyya are, Salafiyya is to follow the Qur'an and the authentic Sunnah the way the companions understood it and practiced it and the way the Tabi'un who follow them in righteousness follow them and the third generation. And this is it in a nutshell, inshaAllah ta'ala. Okay. And this, this is the last question that just came from the sisters. What do the scholars say about the women who do not cover their face and hands, but do wear pro- uh, hijab properly? Once again, there's a difference of opinion amongst the ulama of Ahl al-Sunnati wal-Jama'ah. There is a difference of opinion. There are some ulama who say that the women have to cover everything. Everything has to be covered. And they are... They are ulama of Salafiyyah, of Ahl Sunnah. And they are also ulama to say, no, she doesn't have to do this. That is only on the wives of the Prophet. But those same ulama who say that she doesn't have to cover her face and her hands, those same ulama, they say that in times of fitna, she should cover her face and her hands. Like Shaykh Al Albani, he's one of them. He did not believe that it was obligatory for them to cover. That only the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. But at the same time, he not only said that in times of fitna they should cover, all of his wives, I heard it with my own, my own ears, he said, all the women in my household, they cover their faces and their hands. 
They cover their faces and their hands. Why? Because we're living in a time of fitna. We're living in a time of fitna. So, we don't say, what do the ulama say about those women who don't do this? Or, yeah, there are ulama who say that she's a sinner. And there are other ulama who say that she's not a sinner. So, we leave the affair to Allah. But, if your husband wants you to put on that burqa, if your husband wants you to cover everything, then you should obey your husband. You should obey your husband. And if you obey your husband, after making your five prayers, after fasting your month, keeping your private parts pure and clean and chaste, you'll be able to enter into any of the doors of Jannah that you want. Anyone that you want. Because you have a ta'at ba'daki. You have obeyed your ba'al, which is another word for zawj. You have obeyed your ba'al. As the Prophet used the word Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and as Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala uses that word in the Quran, Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabi na Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa sallam at taslim mazida subhanaka allahum wa hamnika ashara la ilaha illa anta wahdaka la sharika lak astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.